going back to why I enlisted in the first place is I realized the impact it was going to make. My name is Annika Hutzler. I served in the United States Marine Corps from 2017 to 2020, and I was medically retired as a Lance Corporal. I grew up in Aurora, Colorado, in um, just a normal suburban family. I was the youngest of three kids. I grew up doing ballet. That's kind of my entire personality growing up was going to school, doing ballet, and I ended up going to a performing arts high school for high school that I went for ballet, but I also did um, piano and guitar and a bunch of different arts. But the funny thing is, which you'll learn later on in my story, is my high school offered no sports. We did no sports, there was no PE, it was just the performing arts. And so, I don't really talk about my childhood much, so I don't really know what to say really? on this part. Yeah. Really? I, I kind of block that entire part of my memory out, you know? Is it is it bad? Um, I mean, there's some less favorable parts. Yeah. Um, I moved around a lot. Like, I ended up going to five different middle schools. Um, we lost our house. Mm. My family got split up for a couple of years. Right after high school, I went into college, just like most kids do. And my degree is actually in speech language pathology. I went to Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I realized very quickly I did not like college. <laughs> Uh, I didn't like the people I was surrounded with. I wasn't really into partying at the time. And I was there just for my degree and I felt like everybody else was there for the social experience. And so I remember I was in a 400 level audiology class, so a class in my major. And I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And I stood up and I walked out. But then at that point I was like, okay, Annika, you're literally one semester away from graduating, just finish. My last semester, I started asking questions. I started asking people what I should do. I was thinking about just taking a year to figure out what I wanted to do. And at that point, I met a guy and he told me, hey, you should enlist into the military. And I looked him dead in the eyes. I said, do I look like somebody who would be in the military? In hindsight, that's a really funny phrase. But um, he's like, no, hear me out. Like, you don't know what you're doing with your life right now. Like, might as well go do something good for other people. Go do something for your country. You're going to get training. You're going to get benefits. You're going to get life experience. Like, what better place to be than in the military? So I started going around to the recruiters, and I was actually trying to commission into the Air Force initially. But as we all know, the Air Force doesn't need numbers because everybody wants to join the Air Force. And I was standing outside of an Air Force recruiting office and their doors were locked and I was trying to call every Air Force recruiting office within 50 miles. Nobody was answering. And then a staff sergeant, a staff sergeant walks out of the Marine Corps recruiting office and says, hey, what are you doing out here? And I said, yes, you know, sir, I really don't know. He's like, why don't you come in? And at that point, he like trapped me. <laughs> Um, I just, the second you walk into the Marine Corps recruiting office, you feel like you belong. And that's something that I struggled with growing up and going through college. It's like, I don't feel like I belong anywhere. And even in the, what is it called? The DEP? Even in the recruiting process of being in the Marine Corps, I felt like I belonged in the Marine Corps. I felt like this was my family. I could feel like these are my brothers and sisters and I want to fight with them and for them. And so I graduated with my bachelor's degree on May 12th, 2017, and I left for boot camp on May 15th, 2017. Wow, three days later. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I loved boot camp. Really? <laughs> I loved boot camp. Um, it's always the joke. It's like, hey, I've never been to summer camp. Why don't you go check out Paris Island real quick? Yeah. Um, what job did you sign up to do? My job in the Marine Corps was computer systems maintenance, so fixing radios, laying wires, when a grunt says, hey, my radio's not working, and we say, did you try turning it on? Like, that was our job. Mm. Um, but yeah, I love boot camp because it was just, you didn't have to think the entire time you were there. You just reacted. You didn't have to think about what to wear. You didn't think, have to think about what you're cooking that night. You don't have to answer emails. You don't have to answer phone calls. You literally just reacted in the moment. And the moment that you realize that, hey, this is just a game and the drill instructors are going to mess with you no matter what you say or do, like this is just their allotted time to screw with the, the recruits, then it's just kind of a fun game. Right. And you're just 
going along with the flow. So, um, but boot camp is actually where my story really starts. So about five or six weeks into boot camp, I started having pain in my foot. And as all Marines know, pain is weakness leaving the body. So when I went to go tell my drill instructor, hey, my foot hurts, that's exactly what she told me. And I, I don't discount her. I don't think that she made the wrong decision. I think that is very appropriate response for most Marines. So I kept this mindset of, yeah, pain's just weakness leaving the body. I'm just being weak. I just need to toughen up. Everybody's experiencing this. So I did end up finishing boot camp, and then I went on to Marine Combat Training, where I started taking Advil a little bit more, more often than not. And I was like, no, everybody's experiencing this pain. Everybody's taking just as much Advil as me. This is fine. Change your socks, drink your water, take your Motrin. That's what the corpsmen say. And it wasn't until I was in the schoolhouse that I finally did go to medical and there was pretty severe swelling in my foot and they're like, um, yeah, you have a stress fracture. Here's a walking boot. Sent me on my merry way. And that was in November of 2017. Well, this so-called stress fracture never healed. And so they went in for an MRI and on February 1st, 2018, they said, so you never had a stress fracture but you do have a tumor, but don't freak out. And so the type of tumor I had was an intramuscular artiovenous vascular malformation. It wasn't a specific type of tumor, but all the biopsies said it most closely resembled that. And the issue is, um, as all of my doctors say, I've never heard of a tumor in a foot before. Wow. Literally every doctor, still to this day that I tell my story to, it's like, I've never heard about a tumor in a foot. So my tumor was throughout the muscle and it was, because the foot is so dense and there's so many tendons and nerves and bones and everything in such a condensed area, the tumor was kind of growing throughout all of that and causing a lot of pain. And because of the nature of the tumor and because of where it was located, it wasn't an easy fix. So they started sending me out um, outside of the military to try to operate on my tumor. And pretty much every doctor's like, no, I'm not going to touch it because like, I'm not going to be the one responsible for messing up your foot. And so they tried a couple procedures to try to shrink it and that didn't work. And then finally they, I had one doctor when I was supposed to go in for a biopsy um, she comes into pre-op and says, all right, we're going to do a partial rescission of your right foot tumor. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, you said for months that you're not going to operate on my foot. What changed today? Like literally 6 a.m. in the pre-operating room. What changed today that you're going to operate on my foot? She's like, well, your foot was already going to be open for a biopsy. So we might as well try to remove it. And so I become hysterical and I start crying and I'm like, I need to call my medical case manager. And keep in mind, I'm still active duty at this time. I'm still a student at this time at the schoolhouse. And my medical case manager says, as a patient, you have the right to deny medical treatment. However, as a Marine, it will be put in your record that you denied medical treatment and that will affect you when you inevitably are gonna get out at some point. So basically, do the surgery that this doctor has said for months that she doesn't want to do or get out with probably no benefits. Mm. So I went through with the surgery and hoped for the best. And unfortunately it turned for the worst. Um, at that point I had missed so many class hours. I finished my A school in the schoolhouse, but they wouldn't let me pick up for my C school because of all of my medical appointments. And so I was sent down to the Wounded Warrior Battalion in Camp Pendleton. Six weeks after that initial operation, I started having a lot more pain in my foot and it was red and hot to the touch. Those are the basic signs of infection. So I went into Camp Pendleton ER and I'll show you these pictures because these pictures are wild. Um, I went into the ER and I said, hey, these are my symptoms and they said, well, you're not running a fever and your white blood counts normal, go home. The next day I came back in because it had gotten worse. The swelling got worse, the redness got worse, the pain got worse. They said, 
your white blood count's normal, you're not running a fever, go home. On the third day, when I show you this picture, it literally looks like Frankenstein's monster on my right foot and then a normal foot, but they said, you're not running a fever, your white blood count is normal, go home. I show back up to my doctor on that Monday, and I was like, hey, I went to the ER a couple times this weekend. She's like, why? And I was like, oh, well, like, here's what my foot looks like. And she's like, you need to go to the, the emergency room right now. I'm going to call them to make sure they admit you. So I went back in, and turns out I had cellulitis, which is an infection of the soft tissue, and staph. Oh. And they turned me away all those times. And I ended up being inpatient. I ended up having to get another surgery to remove the abscess because it was so, it was such a bad infection. They had to go in and operate on it. And gave me my first pick line, which is, um, it's a catheter that runs from your arm to your heart because you're getting IV antibiotics every single day. And... Yeah, so I had my first pick line infusion. It was supposed to be six weeks for whatever reason. My doctor took out my pick line um, about a week early, said, hey, your white blood count's looking normal. Let's, let's take it out. You don't need these anymore. And so I show back up to the ER because my foot is, again, red and hot to the touch. And I get sent away from the ER three more times when I had osteomyelitis, which means the cellulitis didn't heal and it had spread to my bones. My bones were going necrotic. Um, at that point, I was just so tired. I was so tired of doctors. I was so tired of the surgeries. I was so tired of trying to plead my case that I'm in pain and I'm tired of this. And so I asked my doctor, I'm like, how many times are we gonna do surgeries before this tumor is gonna grow back? Because every surgery, every procedure we did, the tumor was continuing to grow. Um, how many times are we gonna do this before the tumor's growing back, before I have so much pain in my foot before there's so much chronic nerve damage that we're going to have to amputate anyways. And she says, I give it five to 10 years. And at that moment I said, cut it off now because I'm not wasting the next five to 10 years of my life knowing this is inevitable. And I was 22 at the time. And I was like, just cut off my foot. I don't want it. And then we go into about nine months of me begging for anybody who will listen to cut off my foot because I wasn't sleeping, I was in so much pain, my mental health was deteriorating. Um, they were trying to administratively separate me from the Marine Corps at that point because I can't do anything as a Marine, I have a tumor in my foot, I can't PT, I can't do my job. And so I was just like, well, if I just get my leg amputated, maybe things will change. And it wasn't until I came in with like all these medical journals where I had highlighted like people with chronic pain experience this much less pain once they amputate it. And here's all these role models of people who were, who became amputees and are living like their best lives. And I brought in all these documents and journals and photos to my doctor. And I was like, this is why I want my leg amputated. And he's like, all right, let's do it. And at first I was in shock. I was like, really? Like somebody, really? You agree with me? Um, but at, on April 2nd, 2019, I finally had my right leg amputated below the knee. Wow. Wow. It, it's that a, was the very in-depth story that I don't tell a lot. <laughs> wow. Um, <clears throat> were you seeing a lot of different doctors? Yeah, so they couldn't figure out what to do with me because it was a tumor, so you would think send me to oncology. But my tumor wasn't metastasizing. It wasn't spreading throughout my body. It was just growing very rapidly in that region. But then they're also just like, but your tumor is in the foot, so send you to podiatry. But also the tumor is kind of throughout the bones, so also send you to orthopedic. And then, of course, I was also being seen by mental health at the time, and I was being seen by pain management at the time. And my entire Marine Corps career was just going to different doctors. And I don't know about anybody else, but that's not really what I signed up for when I, <laughs> when I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Um, and at this point, you're in MCT still. No, I did finish MCT. Oh, you did? Yeah, so I went to the schoolhouse. I was in 29 Palms um, when they found my tumor. Mm. Oh, you, you got assigned to 29 Palms? Yeah, because that's where comm school is. Oh, gotcha. Oh, so you're in comm school. Wow. Um, did you have, like, family involved? No, um, like I mentioned with my childhood, 
my family's just kind of not around. I kind of was doing this all on my own. Um, I was single. I don't have any kids. I um, didn't have any family there. Like the Marine Corps was supposed to be my new family. And now I'm like, I don't even have that because I can't progress in my career because of all of my very specific medical problems. Wow. And, you, and then, so you end up staying in the Marine Corps for three years? Yes. So they found my tumor at nine months time in service. Um, and then by the time I amputated, it was about two years in service. And then I was able to rehab and people love to tell me they they know amputees that stay in. They know X, Y, and Z, but every Marine's a rifleman. So that's the number one. I, it was really hard for me to do all of the Marine Corps things outside of my job. But there was actually a Marine in Wounded Warrior Battalion when I was there that like stopped me. And he's like, whatever you do, get out now with your benefits. And it's like, what are you talking about? So this guy, I don't want to say his name, but he was a Marine. He got blown up in Afghanistan, lost his right leg, and he ended up rehabbing and redeploying as an amputee. Now, the problem with this is when he inevitably, his body started breaking down um, and he's like, okay, I guess it's time. I'm going to get out of the Marine Corps. They were telling him, well, your amputation is not a disqualifying factor anymore because you proved that you can continue your job with an amputation. Therefore, you get no disability for it. So this guy who got blown up in Afghanistan is saying he doesn't get benefits for his most disqualifying factor. Wow. And so he's like, like, suck up your ego and just get out now if you want the benefits the way you're supposed to. And unfortunately, that's something that I have seen a lot um, as a veteran is this system is so broken and it's so hard to get benefits that you deserve because either people have messed up in the past or people in charge just don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, it seems to be a case these days with a lot of doctors that they're almost just experimenting on you and throwing up a bunch of Hail Marys, yes. right? Yes. Um, what was it like being in the Wounded Warriors Battalion? The Wounded Warrior Battalion, I know has changed over the years, but when I was there from 2018 to 2020, it was honestly a pretty good experience. Really? Um, at the time, everybody, I was a Lance Corporal, everybody's just bitching and being like, my life sucks, everything sucks. Because that's just what we do as Lance Corporals. Um, but they have so many programs in place to help you recover. So when you're there, you're called a recovering service member. And that is your entire job. Like, you, you don't have to do PT, you don't have to do your PFT, because most of us are light duty or limb duty anyways. Um, you don't have to go to rifle call. You don't have to go to swim call. Like you just recover. And so they have so many things in place. They have like art therapy and they have dog therapy and they have like wood turners that come in and you have staff that's supposed to take your appointments, whether or not they do is their discretion. But, um, but yeah, and like the barracks are nice and like they're handicap accessible and it's just a cool environment. But the best part about Wounded Warrior Battalion, the Wounded Warrior Battalion has something called WARP, which is Warrior Athletic Reconditioning Program. And it's basically sports to get you out of your barracks. So the Wounded Warrior Battalion at Camp Pendleton has an entire gym and they have a bunch of coaches for several different sports. They have archery and powerlifting and golf and air rifle shooting and track and field and like pretty much any sport that you're interested in, they have a coach there to coach you and they understand our limitations. And so they can coach you despite the fact that you may need to shoot seated or despite the fact that you're on crutches. And so right before I got my leg amputated, when I was kind of dealing with the mess of my medical team, um, that was a really good outlet for me. That was like my safe place where, hey, I'm dealing with all this other medical stuff, this trying to be a Marine stuff that's not working out and being yelled at for whatever reason over here. But over here I have sports and that's my place where like my coaches believe in me. And 
I just fell in love with sports. I had never done sports growing up. I did ballet my whole life. And the first sport I tried was archery. And from there, like the coaches would see me showing up every day and be like, hey, why don't you come try wheelchair track? Why don't you come try golf? Why don't you come try yoga? And I ended up just kind of trying everything. And there's something called the Marine Corps trials. So in the spring of every year, the, each branch has their own trials where you take all these wounded service members and we all just do sports against each other. And there's individual sports like track and field and powerlifting, but there's also team sports and they're adaptive team sports. So wheelchair rugby, wheelchair basketball and wow. seated volleyball. And you can have zero experience and they'll say, yeah, come to trials, come try it out. And it's open to anybody who is a wounded, ill, or injured service member. And for the Marine Corps trials, we also bring in a couple countries, which is super cool. But it's mostly just the Marines. We have East Battalion versus West Battalion. And if you do well at the Marine Corps trials, you get selected for the DOD Warrior Games. And the DOD Warrior Games is each branch competing against each other. So I did my first Marine Corps trials in spring of 2019, right before I got my leg amputated. I had my leg amputated in April and I was still selected to represent Team Marine Corps at the 2019 DOD Warrior Games and I took home two silver medals. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. They were both in wheelchair track, so um, they were both like, didn't really have to do with my leg, but let me tell you, wheelchair track is still incredibly hard. Is it? Yeah, because you're in like the super awkward position where you're like leaned over and your arms like are doing this weird thing. Like it's not, it's not the easiest sport and I respect people who still do it, but I'm very glad that I am an upright runner now. <laughs> what, what was your, what's been your favorite sport to play? Um, lately it has been track and that leads me to the next part, which is I... COVID kind of was a mess, but um, I ended up, words are hard. I did my first DOD Warrior Games in 2019. Because of COVID, I had to take a couple years off, but then I went back for 2022. And at that point, I was selected to represent Team US in the 2023 Invictus Games next month in Germany. Wow. So um, my, I'm competing in five sports which are track, field, swimming, wheelchair, rugby, and table tennis. But my favorite of those sports is track. And I've been training really hard. I've cut a couple seconds off my 100 meter time. And as long as my research is correct, I am set to set an all time Invictus record in the women's 100 meter sprint. Really? We, wait, wait, you, you did the math calculations for it? What, well, what? they've only done Invictus for a couple years. I, don't quote me on this. I think they started in like 2012, 2014, something mm. like that. Um, maybe a little bit earlier. But anyways, the Invictus Games is Prince Harry's version of the DoD Warrior Games, essentially. And they get all of the countries together. So it's not just the branches, it's the entire country. And so I just went back and looked at all the records of my category for the 100 meter sprint. And... As of my last race that I competed in, I've already beat it. Wow. But I just need to beat it at the Invictus yeah. Games now. When it, when it counts. Yes, yes. Wow. Um, talk to me about what your transition was like out of the Marine Corps. My transition out of the Marine Corps was unique. I was medically retired out of the Marine Corps in January of 2020, and I ended up retiring to Denver with my boyfriend at the time. Um, went to California to do the Marine Corps trials and on March 16th, 2020, California shut down and pretty much the entire world shut down. And so I came back to Denver to be in quarantine. And then in what, what month is after March in April, um, my boyfriend at the time was told his brain cancer got severely worse and he needed to start cancer yesterday. And then in May, his father passed away from a heart attack. So oh. he ended up leaving and like 
no hard feelings there. He was dealing with a lot of stuff. But now, not only am I out of the Marine Corps, where I was like surrounded by people all the time, now my boyfriend at the time had left, and I'm in quarantine in a state that I haven't lived in since I was a kid. Mm. So I was just trying to figure it all out all at the same time. And what I found is there was still a sports community. And in the summer of 2020, when pretty much everything was still shut down, I was still able to find a club track team. And I was running three times a week. And then I would go down to my pool at my apartment and I'd be swimming all the time and meeting people there. And then I would be rock climbing a couple times a week. And then I found out that the gymnastics gym was open. So I was doing adult gymnastics. And I just found that my community is in the sports that I do. So that sense of belonging that I had in the Marine Corps that I lost when I was medically retired was I found a new community within sports. And that's where all my friends were and that's where my new family is. And still to this day, I've been out of the Marine Corps now for three years, I've been an amputee for four. My biggest community and my biggest fans and supporters are people within the sports community, specifically the adaptive sports community, but just in the sports community in general. Wow, it's awesome that you're able to find, find that. Um, yes. You know, because a lot of people leaving the Marine Corps, uh, I mean, not just the Marine Corps, any branch transitioning out suffer from like a, an identity type crisis. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to find that, especially specifically for the Marine Corps, because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody knows the Marine Corps builds some really, really strong camaraderie amongst each other and mm -hmm. stuff. And so trying to find that um, after transition is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you just never find it. Uh, and so that's awesome that you're able to find it in the sports community. Yes. You do a lot of sports. I do a lot of sports. You know how many? Um, I counted the other day. I do 19 sports, and that's give or take a couple because depending on if you count the sports that I've done a couple times and some of the sports like field, I kind of combined discus and shot put into one sport. So I don't know. I'd say roughly 19 to 20 sports. Wow. Would you say that um, being involved in these sports contributes to your mental health? 100%. I honestly believe that sports saved my life. Because when I was in the Wounded Warrior Battalion and dealing with all my medical nonsense, there are a lot of days where I didn't want to leave my barracks room. And it was so easy because I was injured, I had a tumor in my foot, I was dealing with all this other stuff, I wasn't sleeping. It's so easy to make excuses of, oh, I can't show up to practice today. Like, I don't, I just can't get out of bed, whatever else. But when I make a promise, I keep that promise. So if I promised my coach that I was gonna show up to practice on Monday, I was gonna be at practice on Monday because he was relying on me being there. My peers were relying on me being there. And I'm not gonna short myself when I said that I was gonna be there. And so days that I didn't wanna get out of bed, I would force myself out of my barracks room and go to my sports practice. And you know, I always felt better afterwards because to quote um, Elle Woods from Legally Blonde, when people work out, they release endorphins, and endorphins make people happy. And happy people don't kill their husbands, but that's the later part of the quote. That doesn't matter. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's just, it's so easy to make excuses that, like, I can't, I can't, it's too hard. But if you get up and you just go do those things, like, you're going to find that you feel so much better, and eventually you get into the routine, and... When you sit in your barracks room all the time, that leads to some really bad thoughts. So getting out of my barracks room, getting out of my headspace, and just going to work out for 30 minutes, for an hour, whatever it was, it put me in a better mindset and is the reason that I'm still sitting here right now. Mm. Um, you know, I was, I was going through your Instagram and stuff and uh, um, I, uh, you were talking about a cool story about an interaction that you had um, I don't know if it was at the airport. With, oh, with the little girl? Yeah. You know, uh, and so that, that sparked a question for me and I wanted to ask you is, is you know, um, you know, do you recall, 
I, I'd, like, I'd like you to share that interaction here, but also like any other interactions that you have because of your situation that like, mm -hmm. are positive like that. Oh, yeah. So there was one time where I was at the airport waiting for the trains and this little girl runs up next to me because I typically show off my leg all the time because it's sparkly. Why wouldn't I show it off? Mm -hmm. But this little girl runs up next to me and I'm expecting her to ask a question because I'm used to it. Kids, kids are curious. They love to ask questions like, hey, why do you have a robot leg? And she looks up at me and I go, hey, have you ever seen one of these before? She's like, yeah, I have one too. And then she pulls up her pant leg and she's an above knee amputee and she has like the sparkly, I think it was a pink um, prosthetic leg. And I was bamboozled. I was like, wow, you just reversed Uno carded me right there. <laughs> I'm like, now I want to talk to you about your leg. So it's just, it's really cool to have interactions like that because she was covering her leg. Maybe it was for a reason. Maybe it's just the outfit she wanted to wear. But I've been told that it's a lot of people respect my decision to show off my leg all the time because some people are embarrassed by it. Some people don't want to talk about it. Some people want to just blend into society. And I'm just out here confident as ever being like, yeah, come ask me questions about my leg. It's cool looking. <laughs> Um, but that being said, stuff like that happens a lot. And especially because I, I used to substitute teach when I was in Colorado and I always had a speech ready for the kids to ask questions. But there was one time specifically where I was teaching kindergarten and the kids are kind of trickling in here and there. I'm wearing, I think like pants that you can kind of see my leg, but it's not super apparent. But this kid walks in and he stops dead in his tracks. He goes, our teacher has a robot leg. And he runs down the hallway. He's like, our teacher has a robot leg. And he, all these kids are just coming in. And I was like, please go back to your classrooms. <laughs> like, we'll talk about this at recess. It's fine. Wow. But it's just, it's really fun to see people's reactions because you hear the whispers. You hear people saying like, hey, mom, do you see her leg? Hey, do you see that? Why is her leg like that? And like, I love to talk about it. Because the second that a parent or a guardian or whoever is like, no, don't ask questions, don't look, that's rude. Now you're making it a scary topic. You're making it a taboo topic. You can't ask questions about it. Kids are just curious. People want to know. I still have adults that come up to me and it's like, hey, do you mind me asking this question? Because I've always been curious and I just don't know how, how your leg works. And most of the time I'm okay. I'd say there are situations where I'm not really in the best mood and I'm just like, hey, like not today. Like don't take it personally, but just not today. Mm. Um, but I just, as a decent human, I think it's fine that people come up and ask me questions. I don't always want to tell my whole story, but if you're just asking me like, hey, how does your leg work? Or like, do you have one of those, like everyone loves to talk about my running, like, like do you have one of those blade things? I'm like, yeah, I do. So I... I'd say as a general rule, can't say this for everybody, but as a general rule, if somebody is explicitly showing off their prosthesis, they probably don't mind questions being asked about it. But if you see like a sliver of their ankle when they walk with long jeans on, they probably don't want to talk about it. Hmm. So that's just kind of a general rule. Again, don't take it for everybody, but that's kind of me and my friends, what we've established. Yeah, that's very informative. I, I bet a lot of people don't know that. I didn't yeah. know that, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I typically don't go up to random people though to <laughs> ask them personal questions like that. Oh, you'd be so surprised. Really? They're, my favorite story was, I was just not in the mood, but I was sitting at a bar one day and when I sit down, I typically take my leg off. So my leg's like sitting on the side of the bar. And this guy comes up, doesn't say anything. He just says, so how'd you lose your leg? And I said, I had a tumor, so how'd you lose your hair? <laughs> and he was just so taken aback, being like, I can't, I, I can't believe you'd ask that. And I'm like, you just came up to me and asked me a very personal question. Like, you're <laughs> bald, what do you want me to say? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd say the way in which you ask questions also matters. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have been there for that. But, yeah. yeah. The, the bartender ended up, um, she gave me a drink after that because she was laughing so hard. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's so cool. That's such a cool story. Um, did you ever face people that opposed your decision to get it amputate, amputated? Oh, yeah. Everybody. Really? Everybody thought I was crazy. Everybody. I had doctors 
that thought I had something called BIID, Body Integrity Identity Disorder. So those are the people that believe they should be amputees, they believe they should be blind, they will go to extreme measures like literally blinding themselves or literally like putting their foot in dry ice so they can become an amputee because they just believe in their mind that they're supposed to be. So me being a 22 year old hysterical female going to every doctor being like, please cut off my leg. They're like, oh, she has this mental disorder. You know, not accounting for the fact that I have a tumor and all these surgeries on my medical list. But um, yeah, I, my family, when I told them that I was amputating my leg, they were all against it. And I'd say the only supportive people were other amputees who had gone through limb salvage. Limb salvage is a period where they try to save your leg, but your leg is really just a parasite at that point. And all of them, and still to this day, if you talk to amputees who are limb salvage, I know very, very few successful limb salvage stories. And those people that end up getting amputated said, I wish I would have done it sooner. Mm. I've heard that by so many people. I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, I think once I made the decision to amputate, everybody just knew my mindset and just being a Marine, like you have this, like, I'm gonna prove everybody wrong mindset. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, if you talk to any female Marine, that's kind of all of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, when I had my leg amputated, they asked your goals. And my goals were to snowboard again and to dance again. And I did both of those within five months of losing my leg. Nice. Because if you have the right mindset and you have the right team and resources and support, you can really do anything you set your mind to. And something somebody told me is as an amputee, you may not be able to do everything the way you used to, but you'll always figure out a way to do the things you want to. So this is a true story and this kind of speaks to the military medical system. But before I had my leg amputated, when we were finally, my doctor had agreed to it, I still had to do a couple um, counseling sessions, which I'd already been doing therapy, like this was nothing new. But I had a doctor literally tell me verbatim, she said, and she, which people are surprised by, she told me, well, if you get your leg amputated, your self-confidence is going to be affected negatively. And I'm sitting there thinking, I've been in a walking boot for over 400 days. You don't think my self-confidence already down? I haven't been able to work out or do sports. I'm gaining all this weight. You don't think my self-confidence is already down? And so as an amputee, I am in the best shape of my life. I am more confident than ever. I am showing off my leg all the time. So just the fact that she would even consider that was so silly to me. And also if I wanted to cover up my leg, which I, every once in a while I will wear like a long dress or something like that. I have the option to, and nobody can tell. Whereas if I'm wearing a walking boot, everybody can tell always. So I didn't understand why she thought that like, that was the thing to try to deter me from amputating my leg. Mm. What has been the most challenging for you since you've gotten your leg amputated? The most challenging part for me is learning how to rest. Because I think as an amputee, and especially as an amputee who does social media, who does all these sports, like I am seen as this like super active amputee and I'm such an inspiration. I'm always go, 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 and I'm always positive. And I don't allow myself to be human. I don't allow myself days to rest. Like I think, I have to be happy every single day because people are relying on me to do that. And everybody knows that like, I'm human. That's not the case. I'm gonna have bad days. I'm gonna have hard times. But I just find myself, like I'll take a day on the couch where I'm like playing a video game for an hour. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm wasting my entire life. What am I doing? I need to be going and doing sports. I need to be training. It's like, no, sometimes that day on the couch is just as beneficial as your two mile run mm -hmm. because your body needs to rest. And if you, somebody told me that if you don't allow your body to rest, your body will tell you when it's time to rest. Right. And, um, that has happened a couple times where I've been injured. I've had a couple surgeries because I didn't allow myself to rest. And when you're recovering from ankle surgery, when it's your only ankle, you're kind of forced to rest. Wow. 
Um, what's been the most rewarding? <sighs> my f the most rewarding part since losing my leg is knowing that I'm making an impact on people. Because going back to why I enlisted in the first place is I realized the impact it was going to make and it was going to impact other people. And in boot camp, I didn't say this earlier, but in boot camp, I fell in love with the Marine Corps and it's like, I'm going to commission the second hit the fleet. I'm going to do 20 years. Like I want to serve this country. I want to serve people. And when you're medically retired, that's taken away from you. But now as an amputee, I'm really a disability advocate. And I've created the social media platform, which was originally just showing my friends and family, hey, this is how PT is going, this is how my progress is going, to, hey, like I was a new amputee not too long ago, and these are the things I've learned. Here's some little tips and tricks that I learned along the way that may help other people. And I get so many messages from people being like, like you really helped me with my confidence. It's been really great watching your videos, or I didn't know. I didn't even think about gluing fake toenails on my prosthetic foot, but like, I feel prettier now. Like something as simple as that is gluing fake toenails on your prosthetic foot to feel prettier, to have that self-confidence. Mm. And just knowing that I am still making an impact on other people and it's, it's a positive impact. Yeah, big time. I don't want people to discount the way they feel. Like everybody's feelings are always valid. And if you're gonna compare your situation to mine, it's never gonna work out well. Like there was one time where my best friend, she has two legs and she was complaining about, she got these brand new heels. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, she was complaining that she got these brand new heels and her feet hurt really bad. And she's like, I don't even know why I'm complaining to you. You don't even have a foot. And I was like, just because I don't have a foot doesn't negate the pain you're in. Like it's not a fair, comparison because what you're experiencing is not what I'm experiencing. So I never want people to compare themselves, but I also do want to show people what's possible. Mm, yeah. Awesome. You're doing a great job of that. Yeah. Talk to me about what your experience has been like with the VA. My experience with the VA, there's been good and there's been bad. Um, when I moved to Denver, that was the best VA system I had ever been in. I mean, I was brand new um, veteran and I was just thinking like, why does everybody complain about the VA? This is great, I get all these appointments, my doctors are great, everything's fine. And then I moved to LA and that's not really the case. And I mean, I don't wanna to talk too badly about it because they are servicing a huge area for West LA VA, like it's outrageous and so, there's a lot of times where they can't see me for a couple months or it's impossible to get to my doctors or it's like the administration, the administrative part of the VA is just, for lack of a better word, a shit show. And, but they do have systems in place like community care where if they can't see you at the VA for a month, you can ask for community care and that means the VA will pay for a doctor that is in the community, so just a normal doctor, to pay for your whatever visit you need to go to. So I'm glad I have that, but it's just constantly juggling. Like right now, I see about 10 different specialists for different things, and it's really hard to kind of juggle and remember, oh, this doctor's at this place, and this doctor's at this place, and like I have to check in with the VA because they haven't re-upped my physical therapy referral, and it's just, it's exhausting and it really is a full-time job when you're just dealing with the VA and medical system all the time. My biggest advice for people is just go out and do things. Like I think, especially as adults, we're always so worried about trying new things, trying new sports because we're like, oh, we're gonna be bad, it's gonna be embarrassing, there's gonna be people that are better than me, like they won't want me on their team, whatever. But everybody starts somewhere and you don't have to be good at things to enjoy them. You don't, ha you don't have to be going to try a new sport with intentions of being in the Olympics without the intention of playing professionally. Sometimes you can go play a pickup game of basketball because you enjoy it. And you can be the worst person on the team, but if you enjoy it, who cares? Mm -hmm. So I, my biggest advice for people, because I think that's the question I get more than anything else, is how do you get involved in all these sports? You just have to stop being scared of being bad. 
go be bad. Who cares? Literally nobody cares. You're the only person that cares that you're bad. So go out and do things that you enjoy to do and go try new things and you never know where that path is going to lead you. Yeah, a lot of people are, it's, it's crazy how many people don't start something because of, of their, um, they're afraid to fail. Yep. Um, it's, it's so crazy to me. Yeah. Uh, like I, I went to go play wheelchair basketball at UCLA a couple days ago. I am so bad at wheelchair basketball. Like I can play it, I understand the rules, but once we start actually playing, I just panic and I forget everything that I know. But I was out there playing basketball with, with my friends that are all also disabled. Some of them aren't even disabled. Some able-bodied people just got in chairs and played with us. And like, I'm having a good time. My team lost every single time, but I was having fun. Like, and it doesn't matter. Like, we're not playing for money. We're not playing for medals. We were playing at the UCLA Poly Pavilion, which is a beautiful facility. And so just having the opportunity to be out with people and doing something I enjoy to do, whether I'm good at it or not. Like, it's just, it's a cool place to be. Yeah. I understand you also model. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that a little bit. So when I first lost my leg, I went down to a amputee running clinic and the veterans all just find each other. I don't know how it happens. We all just kind of swarm together. And so we exchanged information and a couple months later, I get an Instagram message from one of the guys I met at this running clinic and said, hey, are you interested in modeling at all? And I'm like, I've never really thought about it, why? He's like, well, my agent is looking for a female amputee who can run. And I was like, I'm a female amputee who can run. And so I got in connection with her, I did my very first audition, I booked my first audition, and it was for AT&T. And this comes back to my transition story. I was on set in costume on March 16th, 2020, for this commercial and they had to shut the whole thing down because California shut down. Oh. So that entire commercial got scrapped, but um, my agent loved me. She's like, hey, like I, like I like all the activities you do. Like I represent disabled models. I think you're cute. Like let's just, let's just keep going with this. And I ended up booking a couple more things living in Denver. I booked Athleta and then I booked my first big commercial and it was a USAA commercial and you've probably seen it because it was on everywhere last year. If you watch the Olympics, it was on during that. If you watch Hulu, it was always on during the Hulu ads. It was on during the Super Bowl, and it was the USAA ad that's like safe pilots and it's like Sergeant Moore who leaves room for her room. Like that's me. And I, <laughs> everyone's like, ooh, Sergeant, you got promoted. And I was like, I hope they pay me for that promotion. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then at that point, that's actually why I moved to Los Angeles was because of the modeling and my agent's like, Hey, you just did this big commercial. Imagine what you could do if you lived here. And I did book a lot. Um, last year I booked Target, Kohl's, American Airline. Um, I've booked Lockheed Martin, Android, um, Disney, the North Face. Like I've, I've done a lot of things. I actually just filmed my first movie recently, um, which I can't really talk about yet, but I, I am gonna be in a feature film with a couple lines, which is cool. Nice. But yeah, like it's, it's another way for me to represent this community, the disabled community. And it's amazing because, so this is another really cool interaction I had was, I was at an amputee or an adaptive, I was at an adaptive sports event um, and it was right after I booked my athletic ad. So this mom was talking to me and her daughter was 10 years old, similar level of amputation as mine. She's like, what do you do for a living? And I said, I recently got out of the Marine Corps, but I just started modeling. And this little girl's eyes lit up. She's like, mommy, I think that's the girl from the magazine. And at that point, it like everything hit me at once because she's a 10 year old girl living in middle of nowhere, Texas. So she's the only girl in her whole school who looks like her and probably her whole town who looks like her. And now she's opening up a mainstream magazine that she sees somebody who looks like her in the impact that that's making. And just like, I even find myself when I see a commercial, I see an amputee, whether it's somebody I know or not. And I was like, oh, there was an amputee. Did you see that? Like, I get so excited. And I've only been an amputee for four years. Imagine the people who've been amputees their whole life and never seen themselves represented in the media. So I love modeling 
to be that representation. Like I quite frankly don't care about the money. I don't care about the fame and people knowing me. I don't care about any of that. But what I do care about is that 10 year old amputee who has never seen somebody who looks like her or that adult who has never seen somebody on TV with their level of amputation and just seeing them be normal because it's so easy to look at an amputee and be like, oh, you're such an inspiration. Your whole story is an inspiration, 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 inspiration. But sometimes like you just want to be a character like Imagine a character in a show that's the girl next door that just happens to be an amputee. There's no big story of how she lost her leg. Maybe she was born like that, whatever. But she just happens to be losing her leg. It, there doesn't always have to be a backstory. Mm. And I think that's where media is turning right now. But it's, it's a process to get there for sure. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Any last words before we cut the tape? I'd just say go out and don't be afraid to fail. Because, you know, sometimes you might fail, but if you enjoy what you're doing, like, you never know where your path is going to lead you. Thank you so much, Annika, for being here and contributing oh, your story you. to Urban Valor. And Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Yeah, I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared. Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair. Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear. Take me your way cause I don't like here. Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air. Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares.